Okay, welcome everyone um, to the final installment of our series on strengthening sexual assault in dual and multi-service programs. Um, <clears throat> we have Reedy here from the Sexual Violence Law Center today who's going to talk with us about civil legal options for sexual assault survivors. Uh, and this will be our last version. We're gonna be recording this one um, just for, there's a few folks who aren't able to make it today. So we're able to share this uh, on our website for uh, a period of time so that folks can, um, um, don't have to miss out on the great information here. Um, there has definitely been some updates in lots of different things in the past couple of years um, legislative sessions. So my name is Michelle Dixon Wall. I work here at the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs. I've been your host uh, throughout this series and I'm super happy to see so many of you joining us again. Um, and I think I'll just make sure Lori went away on my side, so I just want to make sure I can find. We switch. Okay, gotcha. I'm trying to find all the little squares so that um, I can make sure to be watching for you all because I didn't see you switch. There we go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to Reedy from the Sexual Violence Law Center and then she can give you a little bit more information about herself and what their organization does. Um, yeah, so thanks, Reedy, for being here today. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I know a question that always comes up is, is this PowerPoint going to be available? And Michelle is going to send out this PowerPoint afterwards. Um, we also, uh, with the support of Wix app, have created a checklist um, that basically is going to be a summary of what we're covering today that you can also start maybe applying uh, in your intake process. Um, so you should be getting that after, after the presentation. Um, so welcome. Thank you for uh, joining me, uh, joining us today. Uh, I am Riti Mukhapati. I use she, her pronouns. I am the director of the Sexual Violence Law Center. Um, we are a small legal aid uh, program. We're based in King County, um, but uh, we are actually statewide in uh, representing sexual assault survivors. Um, the purpose of our program and the purpose of this presentation is that our model is holistic when it comes to civil legal aid. Um, we recognize that survivors deal with multiple legal issues related to their sexual assault, um, often simultaneously. Um, and in order to really be able to support them and ensure um, their path to recovery and stability, um, our, our, our belief is that we really need to be trying to represent survivors in as many legal areas um, as they are identifying. Um, so if the sound of my voice annoys you, if you have other things to do, um, if uh, you know your Wi-Fi goes out or your tech goes out, um, just <laughs> identifying the different areas that we represent in. This is essentially what we're gonna be talking about, all these different areas um, related to assisting survivors. Um, just a little bit more about the program. We represent all gender identities. Um, we aim to be not only holistic, but trauma-informed. And um, 
besides representation, we have three tiers essentially. So full representation where we're going into court, there's also consulate brief um, level services where we may be maybe ghostwriting or helping a survivor put their forms together, put their evidence together and prepare for court. And then um, there's a legal line, uh, which any advocate, any survivor can contact us with questions about their legal rights, the legal process. Um, I would encourage any of you to uh, feel free to reach out to one of our attorneys if you have a case you wanna talk through or you're wondering um, if it's helpful to refer or you're trying to get connected to legal services. Um, the number is gonna be at the end of the PowerPoint, but just in case you want to know it, it's 844-991. 7852. I want to be very clear, we are not a crisis line. Um, that is all of your expertise. Um, a lot of your programs have uh, 24 hotlines. Um, so uh, our purpose is very specific to be able to assist with legal information. Besides working with survivors directly, which is the litigation aspect of what we do. We also um, work on advocacy. So for example, currently we're working with WICSAP on some legislation. And then also lastly, education trainings like this um, and presentations and workshops out in the community. So pr uh, providers are better equipped to work with survivors. Um, I also just want to call out that we have different special initiatives and one that I'm particularly excited about um, is our techie, um, our tech enabled course of control initiative. Digital technologies have become more central um, to our daily lives and they have become not only a platform of communication and connection, but they can also become a source of abuse and course of control. Um, and so the, our techie, our tech, tech initiative essentially looks, was created by a work group of advocates from University of Washington, SPD, from the city, um, and is now housed at SVLC. Um, and our, our focus is to really highlight and connect resources to highlight the fact that tech is used to um, further abuse against survivors and really address and try to um, connect resources to survivors and systems that need to be paying attention to these issues like courts and law enforcement so that they're better equipped to um, respond to tech related abuse that survivors are experiencing. So, um, that's an uh, introduction about our program. Um, the focus of this presentation is holistic civil legal options. Um, this, I think often when we're working with survivors, there it's discussed when it comes to legal options in this dichotomy, either get a protection order or go report to the police. But the fact is that within the civil arena, there are so many more options that survivors have an, have an opportunity to explore. Um, and sometimes we don't think about them as legal options. Uh, I think thinking holistically about civil options for survivors right now is also kind of like the pendulum swing in our, in our profession. Um, I think, uh, you know, years ago when the advocacy field was really developing, when we realized that, you know, survivors don't necessarily get the complete support that they need from community support systems also burn out in trying to support survivors. And it really was important to have professional support that can be ongoing. Um, uh, I, I think we all started out as generalists. I'm a former advocate myself uh, before going to law school. I think we all started out as generalists. And over time, as, uh, as the work has become more professionalized, it's also become much more specific, becoming only a housing advocate, becoming only a sexual assault advocate, becoming only um, uh, employment uh, uh, advocate. And so 
uh, even if your position is funded to, um, there may be funding restrictions, I think it's helpful to still kind of recognize these holistic options. And when I say holistic, I think a lot of your programs do identify as holistic. Um, so I guess I'll actually uh, ask a question to everyone. If you could in the chat, just um, respond with a why, how many of your programs identify maybe as holistic or as providing wraparound services for survivors? I'm trying to see the chat. Okay. So a few, um, some programs are standalone programs, some programs are connected to larger agencies. Um, so it really is about what your capacity is. So much of it comes down to sometimes funding. But when we talk about holistic, um, I mean, at its most core, the essence is basically remembering um, remembering to be client-centered and seeing the client as a person and not as a case. Um, and it's something I also encourage uh, kind of rethinking our narratives when our, with our grants and our funders too, to really get uh, the larger community thinking about how we need to be survi uh, serving survivors holistically. Um, so some hallmarks of being holistic. Uh, first I have, you know, we need to be comprehensive. This is really identifying the full range of legal needs a survivor has and quasi-legal issues, which I'll describe later. Um, being client-centered, many of you know the concept of being trauma-informed and client-centered. Being mobile and flexible, um, this is really important to us. Before COVID-19, for example, it was really rare for us to meet with our clients at our office. We usually only met with our clients at the office if they wanted to come to the office, most of the time we were trying to meet with clients out in the community, uh, in, their at, in the office of their advocates, at their homes, at the public library, with their counselors, um, just to be more accessible. And then really um, basing our representation and support for the client based on the client's identified goals and prior, priorities. And the last part of being holistic is the multidisciplinary approach. Um, we, always the team approach is always preferred um, and trying to really think about all the different needs for the survivor. Um, so goals of holistic civil support, why do this? Because first of all, from the client, we believe it improves their experience in receiving services as uh, well as improving outcomes. Um, secondly, as an advocate, it improves your experience in providing services, being able to really address uh, the more fuller issues that a client is surviving instead of feeling like, you know, you just put a bandaid on a flood. Um, and then a better understanding often what the client's choices are and um, why, why they responded the way they did, why maybe the issue that you initially focused on might not be their priority. Um, and then lastly, for the agency, it's also improving the quality of services provided. And hopefully if we're approaching uh, serving clients holistically, there are gonna be survivors who are going to be fewer survivors returning to us because they're just in a better position. Um, So I have listed here some of the reasons why we always suggest a holistic approach. Uh, I would love it if folks could unmute themselves um, and maybe take a minute to share also any other reasons that you identify that holistic support is, is important or maybe a preferred approach when serving survivors that that's not on here. And by the way, I also teach at the law school. 
So I'm very good at just sitting in silence and waiting until students respond. So I, I hope folks will feel comfortable responding. What, what are some other benefits of being holistic that you can think of? Yes, Michelle. This is Michelle talking. Um, so, uh, I mean, just really simply for me and kind of just a lot of the conversations that we've been having over the last uh, few weeks is that survivors are whole people. They have more, um, there's more about them that they're, than their assault. Uh, there's more about them than their case. Um, and so, yeah, simply people are, are whole people. They're more than just the one thing that's happening in their life. Exactly. Any other thoughts? There's no wrong answers, by the way. I and can some share. Of yeah, go ahead. So my name is Deidre, and I was going to say that I think uh, our, it's not really adding to what is on here for a holistic civil support, but I don't really know how you can do advocacy without being holistic, because I believe advocacy is about relationship building and connection and seeing people for who they are and what they're experiencing. And so that means you create a space where they share what it is that they want to share, regardless of what your role is. You may not be able to support with everything that they're sharing with you, but you can offer some connection, you can offer resources, you can try and get them to maybe someone else who could assist with that. Thank you, Deidre, exactly. Any other thoughts on the benefit of being holistic or reasons to try to be holistic? Okay, so the holistic approach, some of your programs, it may not be possible based on funding or focus to uh, be holistic in the most obvious way, which is really assist the survivor directly. But like Deidre said, even being able to identify resources and direct a survivor can really make a difference. So I'll use the example of myself. Um, you know, I love my job. I love being able to really work with the survivor on the different uh, issues that they're identifying and not have to turn them away and say, sorry, we just don't do that. Um, but previously I used to be a public defender before this job. And prior to that, I was an immigration attorney at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. And when I was at NERP, I could only work on my client's immigration case. I couldn't work on their housing case. I couldn't work on their social security case. When I was a public defender, I could only work on my client's criminal case. I couldn't work on their family law case. I couldn't work on their employment case. And um, as frustrating as that felt, it was really important that I identify resources in the community. So even if I couldn't work on it, I could then direct the client. So at least the spectrum of victimization, the continuum of victimization, hopefully that we're able to cut that off. Um, with civil legal services, uh, there's actually research that confirms that a holistic approach is really, really crucial to a survivor's recovery when it comes to legal needs. Uh, this is um, just a chart from the Washington Civil Legal Needs Study that occurred in 2015, 2016. The average indigent low-income person um, is uh, maybe dealing with between seven to nine legal issues. Uh, when you experience domestic violence or sexual assault, that actually skyrockets to 18 to 19 legal issues. Um, and in our representation on average, for example, we end up representing survivors bet on between five to seven issues. And I mean, the most recent case that we've had, we've represent the survivor on 12 different legal issues. So the research is there just to show how much more vulnerable and how, how much higher the needs are for the clients we serve. And I also think about like uh, the holistic approach as essentially trying to attack the multi-headed hydra. So 
for any of you who know the mythology um, with a hydra, you cut off one head and another head appears. And uh, I think in the like the myth, uh, it's it's Hercules, or if any of you have seen the Disney movie, it's Hercules who kills the hydra. And the way uh, I th he figured out you're supposed to kill the hydra is that when you um, cut off the head, you actually have to cauterize it too. So you really have to think proactively about how to prevent further heads from popping up. And I think of uh, holistic, um, the holistic approach um, being uh, essentially attacking the multi-headed hydra for a client. Um, and recognizing that unmet needs actually undermine our advocacy because that means that the client is having to come back. The survivor is just not necessarily going to be able to move forward and um, find stability until a lot of these other issues are addressed. Um, so within legal advocacy, I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about the specific legal areas, but a lot of times um, with legal advocacy and thinking about civil legal options, um, the question is, what does holistic really look like? How do you start implementing that? And so we've identified it as really having a comprehensive sc screening tool, um, both identifying what are legal and maybe non-legal needs or quasi-legal needs, really acknowledging the, the barriers that the client is experiencing, not just being clinical about it, and also acknowledging the client's strength, really following the what the client is identifying as their priority area and developing a service plan. Um, and then of course, coordinating with other um, service providers. Whenever we're working with a survivor, we are always wanting to make sure that they are connected to a DV advocate or a sexual assault advocate. We always wanna make sure that they're connected to uh, counseling services and any other services that they are identifying as important to them. Uh, being holistic is also a chance in maybe resetting and rethinking uh, the current approach to the work. Um, so one way of resetting is thinking about like maybe correcting what we identify as bad habits, just being very issue focused and just only focusing on the, um, uh, the issue that the client is presenting with and not really thinking about anything else. And then putting uh, non-presenting issues on the back burner. The problem with that is that those back burner issues eventually become emergency issues. And then you're in this reactive position instead of being proactive. Um, it's really normal to just wanna focus on the areas that we're most comfortable with. So for example, with my immigration background and criminal law background, um, it'd be really easy for me to try to make every case fit immigration, every case fit uh, criminal issues, but uh, really kind of rethinking what our ex expertise are and recognizing that uh, there's more, there's so much more beyond that that the client is coming uh, with. Um, and then lastly, really thinking about uh, how we approach the work, our own implicit biases, our own perceptions, and how that can sometimes color the work, how that can overshadow what the client's priorities are. Um, some good habits to think about when you're rethinking of the holistic approach is um, really, I mean, in the end, the focus is being client-centered and helping the client. So really creating a service plan and recognizing that it may need to be modified. It may change as needed, depending on what the survivor is experiencing. Um, another good habit is keeping evidence organized. A lot of the information that you're gathering at the intake process or that you're getting with the client um, through the case is actually gonna be information that is applicable regardless of what the legal issue is and um, can apply to multiple cases. And so helping that client really get organized with their evidence and information can really be helpful in them navigating different uh, legal systems, coordinating with multiple providers, and then also 
thinking beyond just the safety, immediate safety issues and considering all the basic needs. I didn't put it on here. I always, always encourage advocates, clients, survivors that we talk to and other attorneys to also visit uh, WashingtonLawHelp.org. Um, let me just put it in the chat here. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, WashingtonLawHelp.org. It is actually a website that if you're not familiar with, many of us in civil legal aid have contributed to it and it covers a whole breadth of legal issues and it's supposed to be very pro se friendly. It's supposed to be user friendly for people who do not have attorneys on how to navigate different legal issues, how to deal with the family law case, how to deal with the unemployment case, how to deal with the housing case. So I think it's a great resource um, for any advocate who is working with survivors. Because we are talking about legal, uh, legal issues and civil legal needs, it's really also important to kind of think about when you're engaging with the survivor, when you're advocating for the survivor, what, what may fall under unauthorized practice of law and what does not. Um, we are, as PLC's approach is, uh, you know, the, as much as you can do for the survivor, but not at the risk of losing your license or not being able to serve survivors in the future because you've been reprimanded or because you've gotten in trouble. So there's a balance there, of course. As an advocate, it's important to support a survivor, but it's not okay to, for example, give them legal advice, um, especially for a fee. Uh, for example, we found out about a program that required survivors to pay um, before they could speak to an advocate. Um, that, that is a problem. Um, and that is something that, uh, that they shouldn't be doing. Um, telling them specifically uh, how to, um, like what legal documents or agreements um, that they, uh, they need to be um, identifying and working with them on really drafting and completing the legal document. So it's one thing to help a client put a narrative together. It's another thing, for example, if you are drafting a contract for a survivor. Representation in court, actually speaking on behalf of a survivor in court, uh, representing meaning um, actually making arguments on behalf of a survivor in court or any sort of proceeding and basically negotiating on behalf of the survivor. These are specific conduct that fall under representation and legal representation. So these are things to pay attention to. But there's so much more that you can do. Obviously, help the client access self-help publications like WashingtonLawHelp.org, identify free court forms and other resources that the survivor can be using and looking at discussing all the options with the client, um, not just the protection order, but other legal issues um, and having those conversations about what are they seeing, what are their legal needs. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, with protection order cases, helping them actually fill out the forms themselves. Um, there's nothing wrong with telling a survivor, you know, this is how I've seen the court sort of focus on these areas. So you wanna make sure to fill out this part of the section, or I know that the court's gonna reject this document unless this part is signed. And then helping them put the narrative together, put the declaration together. And then of course, um, helping the client get connected to an attorney um, and being very clear that you are not an attorney. Um, advocate, attorney, the language is used interchangeably a lot. And in your advocacy role, there, there's so much overlap because you are working in legal systems like the criminal system, like the civil system. And for a lot of our clients, a lot of survivors, for them, there isn't a distinction so information that you're sharing with them, it's just really important to be clear that you're not an attorney, it's not legal advice, but this is what I know, but this is what I've seen. Um, but 
I always recommend not only just having that conversation with the client at the very beginning, but just have it in an ongoing way, just as a reminder. And as an attorney, my recommendation is always to put it in writing as well, um, whether in your email communication or if your program does um, any sort of agreement with the client, um, having that language in there. Anything other than essentially the application of legal principles and judgment related to a client's um, circumstances, um, which requires basically the knowledge and skill of an attorney, a uh, person trained in law, anything outside of that falls under advocacy and falls under what you can do. Um, so don't feel like your hands are tied. And if you are worried about engaging in the unauthorized practice of law, you can always contact us and just, you know, double check. I'm sure your supervisors will know, but sometimes there can be gray areas and you can always contact us and we're happy to talk it through with you. Or if you're worried that you're kind of dipping your toe in there and you may be jeopardizing your program or your position, um, you can always, you know, be on a call with a client with us to ensure that you're not the one that's providing legal advice. We can do that with the client and then um, have you support the client, uh, the survivor, um, with the information that we do provide. So, you know, thinking about like what advocates can specifically do, just to give you a sense, it is very, very broad. It is not meant to be restrictive. The main thing is around legal practice and legal advice. Um, so, you can still share information about the legal process, what you've seen, language you've seen that the court use. You can share information about specific judges and attorneys. I really encourage all advocates to be doing this if you're familiar with your local court and your local bar. Um, we've seen survivors spend so much money on a really, really terrible, basically shitty attorney who does not actually represent survivors uh, maybe they're a criminal defense attorney and they're not familiar with the civil process and the survivor doesn't get the appropriate representation and advocacy they deserve. And then they also have an attorney that they've already, they sometimes often feel beholden to because they've paid money. Um, specific information about specific judges is really also important for survivors to be able to navigate sometimes really hostile court systems um, I, for example, depending on the day of the week, I will encourage survivors, depending on what county they're from or the day of the week, I will tell them on what day is the best day to file because then I know that their protection order is going to end up in front of a specific judge or a commissioner versus a different day where there may be a problematic judge or commissioner looking at the case. Information like that is okay to share. Information that you've observed um, yourself is okay to share. Um, fact sheets, resources, common sense information, um, anything that you would talk to a friend about, I think it's okay to share. Um, and then of course, the, the expertise that you have that most attorneys do not have. We are not the best about thinking about safety planning. We are really not the best about thinking about what happens to sur the survivor after they leave court or before they get to court. Um, so those are the expertise that as advocates you're bringing and um, really connecting that to the legal work. I think about a lot of our volunteer attorneys and having <laughs> even the basic conversation with them about you really need to talk to your client about how to even get to court and where they need to go. Um, often as attorneys, we're just so used to kind of doing our own thing, we don't think about the fact that the systems that we are a part of are not friendly, user-friendly, and um, can be very hard for survivors to know how to access without guidance. That's where you really come in with being the survivor's eyes um, in the system. And then of course, being able to provide them advice about how to communicate with other systems. So for example, with law enforcement, you know, if a survivor is gonna report, there's nothing wrong with talking to them about 
the kind of information they want to make sure that the detective knows what kind of information it's okay for them not to share. Um, so, uh, and I have attorneys on here too. A lot of times what we're doing when, if we're unable to represent a survivor, but we're trying to get them connected to a volunteer attorney, a lot of times what we're doing is we're taking the survivor's experience, their story, and then packaging it in a way where we know that this attorney is going to be able to then take it. We're not lying about the information. We're not changing the information. We're just sort of changing what, or we're um, identifying the, or we're highlighting the information that we know that the attorney is going to be paying attention to. Often survivors go into court and they're so focused on the emotional experience that they've had that they forget that the legal system is very fact specific. So we may be highlighting how traumatizing the experience has been for a survivor, but when talking to the attorney, we're talking about deadlines, we're talking about interesting legal issues within the case that attorney may be interested in advocating for, things like that. So being able to communicate with the survivor about these areas um, is completely okay. And because I talked about legal and quasi-legal issues, it's just helpful to also kind of make that distinction. Not everything needs to be a court case that is filed. Not everything is necessarily actionable um, within court or needs a legal response. And so also really talking to the client and to the survivor that you're working with about, you know, is this a specific legal issue that it's helpful to connect to an attorney or it's helpful to get some legal information on, or maybe it's a non-legal issue or a quasi-legal issue where there's other ways to advocate and navigate the system. So before we jump into the actual civil legal areas, um, I just wanted to take a pause and see if there are any questions. And you can either put it in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself, I'll just give it about like 30 seconds. And thank you for putting that in the chat, Michelle, that's true. Be able to share information about the commissioners, not just like what their personality is like, but the kind of things that they focus on um, and how the courtroom set up is so important for a survivor to feel confident enough to be able to go through the process when they don't maybe have an attorney there with them. I'll give it like another 10 seconds just in case anybody is writing. Um, so I'm gonna go into the specific different legal areas that often our survivors are struggling with, um, legal issues that our survivors are often struggling with and um, that we consistently see high legal needs in. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth <laughs> Each area could be its own session. And if your program's interested in learning more, I'm happy to like talk to your advocates or have one of our attorneys reach out to you, or we can talk to like Michelle about like if there are other ways we can get that information to you through Wixap. Um, if you have case specific questions that you're handling, you have a case right now that you wanna ask questions about, um, I'm gonna, I, my email is going to be at the end of this PowerPoint. Feel free to email me or call us. Um, please don't share it here in the chat um, right now, but I'm happy to follow up with you separately about case specific um, questions that you might have. So the first area is probably the most familiar, familiar area for all of you, um, which is the civil protection order. I wanted to just highlight it just to identify that most of, uh, most of the advocates we work with either work on domestic violence protection orders or sexual assault protection orders. Um, I actually, uh, in my experience, haven't seen a lot of overlap where an advocate works on both sexual assault and domestic violence protection orders. Um, 
a majority of the advocates we end up working with are more familiar with the DVPOs than the SAPOs, but these are the two kind of protection orders that at least within our field, I've seen advocates most familiar with. But just a reminder, Washington actually has six different protection orders. There's also the anti-harassment order, which is a, you have to show a pattern of conduct. It can't be just one time. Well, I'll just go through each of them just very briefly, just in case it's helpful to somebody. The domestic violence protection order, this is basically you are showing that as the victim, you have a household relationship with the person who hurt you. So that could be an intimate partner, husband, partner, ex, um, or somebody you are related to through mar marriage or blood. Um, so this could be an aunt, an uncle, um, a grandfather, um, a grandparent, or somebody that you have a household relationship with or roommate relationship with. So often roommates, um, we've seen roommates um, apply for domestic violence protection orders. And then the conduct actually covers everything that's in the other protection orders. So any sexual assault, any physical harm, any stalking behavior, or any threatening behavior. So maybe they haven't physically hurt you, but they are threatening to hurt you or hurt themselves. Um, those all fall under a domestic violence protection order. If you do not have a, what's considered like a dating or household or intimate partner relationship with your abuser, depending on what kind of abuse it is, then one of the other protection orders may be more appropriate. So for example, the sexual assault protection order statute was written in, I think like 2006 or 2008. Basically what they realized was when they wrote the law for the DVPO, they protected anybody who was sexually assaulted within a relationship, within a family relationship or within a household relationship or a dating relationship. But if you were sexually assaulted by a non-family, non-household member, so by a teacher, a classmate, a neighbor, an employer, a stranger, you did not qualify for any sort of protection. Um, and so the sexual assault protection order statute was written um, in response to sexual assaults that did not have that family relationship. There's the anti-harassment order, order. This is the protection order where um, it, there has to be a pattern of harassing behavior that's actually causing um, fear, imminent fear, or causing um, uh, just distress for the petitioner. Um, I want to highlight the word pattern. It can't be just a one-time event. This is where we often see people go to court and then nothing happens because there's no pattern established. But if there has been ongoing behavioral issues, this is where we often see like bullying, cases involving bullying where people are getting uh, anti-harassment orders filed. Um, stalking, the stalking order actually came out of the fact that often law enforcement did not enforce anti-harassment orders. And then in Pierce County, we actually had um, a terrible tragedy where a teacher who had filed multiple anti-harassments and nothing ever came of her stalker was then killed by her stalker. And so um, the stalking order actually came out in 20, I think 14 or 20, yes, 2014. And the way I identify stalking compared to anti-harassment, it's just more elevated. There's more of a fatality concern there. Um, often stalking also includes technology, tech-related stalking, cyber stalking. So kind of thinking about that the nice thing in Washington is that the anti-harassment and the stalking petition have now been combined into one form as of, I think a year ago, two year and a half ago. Um, so if you're not sure if it's anti-harassment or stalking, um, what I encourage survivors to do is just mark both boxes, both boxes at the beginning of the petition. There's the vulnerable adult protection order. This really focuses both on physical abuse of a vulnerable adult, 
but also other types of abuse. So it can be also financial abuse. So it's not just physical and sexual, but there's other types of abuse that the vulnerable adult protection order covers that the other protection orders don't necessarily recognize as abuse. But it's not enough that somebody be uh, maybe uh, an adult and just like, uh, you may consider them vulnerable maybe based on a disability or based on capacity or ability, but uh, the vulnerable adult protection order actually has very clear expectations and a definition of who might be considered a vulnerable ad adult. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The last one in the most recent protection order is extreme risk protection order. This is actually related to firearms. This is not a domestic violence or sexual assault or any of these other orders. This is mainly to get firearms away from somebody who either a family member or law enforcement has identified as dangerous. Um, and unlike the other protection orders, this one actually allows law enforcement to file against a private person, against um, somebody because there's an understanding that maybe family members may not feel safe enough to file for protection against somebody who may have access to firearms. Um, so that is a real quick summary, <laughs> as quick as possible, summary of the different protection orders in Washington. One thing I really wanna highlight is that um, you may be familiar with one protection order, but not to disregard other protection orders that may also apply in, in your client's case, in the survivor's case. So for example, I have filed a sexual assault protection order and a vulnerable adult protection order on behalf of a survivor, just because first of all, I feel like if I give the court more options, then at least it guarantees that one of the protection orders will be granted. Um, and I just want to make sure that the survivor has all of their options available through the court process and I'm not closing the door on something. I've filed a sexual assault protection order and a stalking protection order on behalf of clients. Um, so, so just realizing that you don't have to only choose one protection order if depending on the type of abuse the survivor is experiencing, if the abuse meets the definition of more than one of these, then, then um, actually maybe talking to the survivor about considering filing more than one petition, seeking more than one protection order is an option I want you to consider. The only exception to this is that you cannot file a domestic violence protection order and a sexual assault protection order because that's based on the relationship with the abuser. So either you're saying that there was some sort of domestic relationship or you're say saying there wasn't. So that's, that's the only place where you can't necessarily file both protections um, at the same time. But otherwise, uh, do keep in mind that, you know, Abusive behavior, it just covers a whole spectrum of behavior and it can fit many of these protection orders. Okay, family law is another big one that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. It's um, outside of the criminal and um, protection order issues that people come to us with. Family law is the, I would say, third highest area that we see a lot of needs, especially um, because in child sexual abuse cases, um, cases where there's domestic violence and a family law issue, we know that the court system is often stacked against the survivor. And there are just so few attorneys who are often willing to take cases where there's domestic violence and sexual assault, especially child abuse happening. Um, this is covering a lot of areas that most of you are familiar with, but definitely making sure to talk to the survivor based on their relationship um, to identify if there may be potential family law issues. It's really obvious when um, there are, um, there is a marriage or there are children involved. Um, but uh, we've had cases where, you know, we've been working with the survivor directly 
and uh, we didn't do a good job of asking questions. And then it turns out there's, um, you know, a child from a past relationship where there was no parenting plan in place, there wasn't a marriage involved, and now all these family law issues are coming up. Um, so definitely not only talking to the survivor, but also ensuring that you, you have had a chance to assess, you know, are there any children involved and are there potential family law issues coming up? Um, I also just really want to highlight uh, within family law, we can sometimes forget about these other sort of non-divorce, non-parental, non-parenting um, plan issues like adoption, dependency. This is where um, the child may no longer be uh, safe in the parent's home because of abuse, abandonment, and neglect. And now the state is looking at potentially removing the child. Termination of parental rights. Uh, it's been about two years, but there has been statutory changes where if a child is born because of a rape, um, the parent, often the mother, um, can seek to petition to terminate the father's right, the father's access to the child. But it often has to happen within, I think, the first three years of the child being born. Um, so this is a very new law to be paying attention to. Courts have not really seen too many of these. We've handled only, only, only a handful of these cases so far. And we get a lot of questions from family law attorneys because um, there's just a lot of fear to bring up sexual assault as a part of a family law case. Um, but there now is that new statutory right for a sexual assault survivor to petition the court to terminate the right of their rapist access parental right to the child. Um, and then the last one I want to highlight under family law is, um, is emancipation. So this is uh, an area that we actually don't see um, a lot of often um, a lot of advocates or even family law attorneys identifying, but if the child, if you are working with a child um, and who is 15 years of age and is seeking to get away maybe from their parents or get a protection order, definitely explore emancipation as an option for that child. Um, I'm gonna just take a quick pause, just to ask if you could in the chat, um, oops, if you could in the chat, just say, um, maybe put in a Y if you work with uh, child survivors or an X if you don't. Um, I know there, I don't know if there are any CACs um, also on this call, but, or on this webinar, but that would help me. Okay. So quite a few of you, well, it looks like we have only five participants in this webinar. That's so sad. Um, so it looks like there are five of you and um, at least four of you, <laughs> thank you, Haley. Um, at least four of you, or more of you do work with child survivors. It sounds like your program, you do work with child survivors or in your position, you are able to work with child survivors. Um, uh, I just want to highlight emancipation, not because it's an option for every child who's over 15. There are specific things you have to show to the court that this child can be independent. So do they have their own bank account? Um, do they have a job besides going to school? Um, have, would they be able to pay rent on their own? Those are things um, uh, uh, you would have to show as a part of emancipation. But it's an option if you are working with a survivor who is 15 or 16 years old, 15, 16 or 17, it's an option to consider um, exploring with them. So most family law cases, you're addressing custody, visitation, addressing child support. Um, often a protection order might be wrapped into that as well. But just thinking about these other areas of family law when, uh, when doing an intake with, with the survivor. 
And what are things that as an advocate you can do? So you can help them fill out the paperwork. You can help them fill out the paperwork for the protection order. You can help them fill out the paperwork for the petition for dissolution. Um, you can direct them to the appropriate pu publications like on Washington Law Help. You can show them where to find the forms, going to the Washington court website itself and helping them download the forms and identifying uh, at least the section or the areas of the forms that do apply to them. Um, and then discuss discussing options with them when they're filling out the paperwork. What information are they comfortable sharing right now? What information maybe they're not comfortable sharing? A lot of times in family law, if you're bringing up domestic violence or sexual assault, um, it can open up a floodgate because of the fact that the abuser is now super pissed that the survivor is making public um, about the abuse and that can make the family law process more complicated. Um, we have seen family law attorneys consistently advise survivors not to bring up uh, the abuse. We have a different approach to that ourselves because we just wanna make sure that that survivor understands that sometimes if you're not creating the record now, if you bring it up later on, the court may use that against you and say, well, I think you're lying because you didn't tell us this was happening before. So we just wanna make sure that survivors are aware of that. And that's a conversation you can have with the clients that you're serving, with the survivors you're serving. You don't necessarily want to tell them what to do, but you want to make sure that they're aware of um, how a court may approach or approach the case, depending on what kind of information they share. Um, and then always making referrals to programs like us or other providers. Um, a lot of counties have family law clinics and making sure that the survivors are aware of those options as well. Can't believe I just put family law in one <laughs> PowerPoint slide. It is a monster. And for any of you who have been there working with your clients through that process, seeing them go through that process, you know what I'm talking about. So um, I'm happy and I know my coworkers are happy to talk to you more about individual, maybe cases that you have questions about or uh, want to discuss. Uh, okay, so the next area, housing. Um, is another area that many of you might be familiar with, more familiar with compared to some of the civil areas. But this is especially, I think um, a lot of times what I see happen is that the survivor was sexually assaulted or has experienced domestic violence or stalking. And the focus has really been on getting them the protection order or making sure that police report is made and then the investigation is happening. And the focus has been on the criminal side and the civil protection order side, but then there hasn't been real conversations around how has their housing been affected? How are they feeling safe where they're at? Um, even if the sexual assault or the domestic violence itself did not occur at their place, at their home, um, if there is continued stalking behavior or if there's been contact made by the abuser at their home and the survivor is not feeling safe, they may have a basis to be able to break their lease. Um, or uh, depending on the kind of trauma and the uh, experience that they, they're having around safety with their housing, there may be, it may be appropriate to ask housing for a, accommodations under the ADA. So for example, we worked with survivors in making sure that the management company starts putting up cameras um, or actually has a lock on the front door so people from the public can't easily access the building. Um, I want to highlight because of COVID-19, even though there's a moratorium on housing evictions um, and evictions based on rent, um, we've been seeing um, you know, what some folks are calling property pimping, where landlords are now uh, putting pressure on residents to essentially pay them back or pay rent through forced sex, through sexual assault. Um, and so maybe 
in the housing situation, they weren't a survivor before, but because of their landlord, they are now a survivor. Um, there are, um, with breaking a lease, uh, I guess I'll go back up. With breaking a lease, uh, you have to identify as a domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking survivor. Um, and like I said, if the abuse happened, if the assault happened itself in, at that place, at the housing, um, so that feels very clear cut. But sometimes if the abuse happened elsewhere, but the abuser has continued to try to contact the survivors engaging in stalking, that can also meet the definition of um, uh, why a survivor should be able to break the lease without any penalty, without any uh, cost. Um, one thing as an advocate that you can do is provide essentially a certified letter. Um, it is not enough for a survivor to be able to say, I was raped in my, in my you know, apartment. Um, the law requires a third party essentially certification. So either from law enforcement, often we're working with advocates on drafting letters like this when um, the survivor reports to you that is essentially you are essentially a third party certifier who can then then confirm that this person was sexually assaulted or harmed or abused uh, in that unit. Um, the other thing about breaking the lease is that it's helpful to know is that there's a 90 day limit on that. Um, a survivor can't after a year say, um, well, I don't feel comfortable staying here. I've been here a year. I've realized I don't feel comfortable. It happens, but unfortunately, the law itself puts a 90 day limit on that. One way we try to stretch it is we try to, it's not just necessarily the date of the abuse, but what has happened afterwards where there maybe has been ongoing contact or stalking or harassing behavior. So we try to stretch that timeline, but it's something to pay attention to and really explore with your client about um, if their housing has been compromised, getting that paperwork started around breaking the lease. 88 com accommodations, like I talked about. Um, so um, landlord exploitation, these are things that it's really, really important to um, also report to the police. Um, as much as we may not want to get um, the criminal system involved, um, especially in situations where if this is happening to your client and depending on how much access the landlord has to other tenants, it's potentially uh, problematic for other survivors as well. So um, something to explore. Um, Residential Landlord Tenant Act there. Unfortunately, Washington has one of the weak, weaker tenant rights um, acts compared to the rest of the country. Um, the, the landlord lobbyists have a lot of money and a lot of power. Um, so it's been really hard to get um, more pro protections in place for tenants. However, under the ADA accommodations, under a lot of the DV and sexual assault um, statutes, there are ways to um, advocate for a survivor um, under the Residential and Landlord Tenant Act. Um, obviously, emergency housing is an issue to explore. Um, just because a survivor may not feel comfortable living in their place temporarily doesn't mean that they're necessarily giving it up. Um, and that's especially um, if you have clients who are uh, in HUD housing, uh, these are issues to be paying attention to and talking to them about what kind of impact it could have on their housing if they leave their housing, depending on how long. Protection orders, civil, these civil issues always interconnect, but also remembering in the housing situation, sometimes if you can't get the landlord to evict a resident, a resident who's, you know, sexual assaulting other people, abusing other people, a protection order may be one way to do that. There has been an eviction moratorium in Washington because of COVID-19, but protection orders are an exception to that. Uh, you don't get to use COVID-19 as an excuse to 
stay in your housing and continue to abuse, assault, stalk other other members of that housing unit of that apartment. So um, keeping that in mind with housing, some things that, that as an advocate you can do, you can facilitate communication between the landlord and the survivor, the tenant. You actually don't need an attorney involved. And this is where I would say it's like a quasi legal issue um, because you actually don't need to get the court involved. Um, as an advocate, you can help them fill out an application uh, for new housing, help them fill out applications for obviously the protection order, um, assist in identifying emergency housing, and then um, also making sure to feel comfortable um, providing those letters that uh, help a survivor um, be able to break their lease if they're feeling like they can no longer live where they're at. We've had advocates who feel uncomfortable doing that because they're concerned about it maybe um, violating a, the advocate privilege that the statutes allow for sexual assault and DV advocates to have with their clients. But if the client is giving you permission, it's okay to provide that letter. You do not have to provide any additional details except for identifying the fact that um, on what date that the abuse occurred, that your client was the victim, that you know that they lived and in that unit, and the fact that they reported to you or they told you about the abuse, that, which allows you to be the certifier. Um, and if you're concerned about what that looks like, we have templates that we're happy to share with you. But it's a separate conversation, but very, very quickly. We've often seen advocates um, be concerned about the privilege issue, but the survivor is the one that holds the privilege. It's not the advocate, meaning the survivor controls who the advocate can and cannot share information with. Um, the advocate should not share information with anyone without the survivor's permission, but if the survivor is saying they're okay with it, then the advocate cannot be <laughs> then trying to gatekeep and prevent the survivor from accessing whatever resource or services they need um, by waiving that privilege. Um, so, okay. I'm gonna, we have a couple of areas to cover, but I'm gonna take a quick pause just to see if there are any questions with family law housing and protection orders. This is Michelle. While folks are thinking about your question, um, I just wanna say, Reedy, thanks so much for that reminder uh, about privilege that it does belong to that survivor. I know one of the things that we talk about a lot around confidentiality is that, you know, sometimes in ways to, to avoid like releasing somebody's file or, you know, sometimes clients want, that, want their files released that writing a letter Really the best thing that we can do um, for a number of things um, to verify somebody's getting services um, can always help, you know, and keeping them even just really simple. I would always just like give it to the survivor so that they're in charge of where it goes uh, or giving them a couple of copies so they can use it if it's just like a verification um, because there are just so many hoops for folks to jump through as they are just trying to get resources, uh, just trying to get people to believe, you know, what they've experienced. And so, you know, unfortunately we can be, that we're really needed uh, for that to kind of open some of those doors and, and writing letters on our official agency letterhead, even if it just says, you know, a couple sentences um, about the services they received or that we acknowledge there you know, that they've reported their abuse to us or something like that, that can be so powerful and such a great tool for them and such an easy thing for us to do as advocates. Thank you, Michelle, that's so true. I mean, I'm gonna talk about immigration and some other areas too, and being able to have an advocate be able to talk about uh, what the survivor has been through or the survivor's experience with the survivor's permission is so helpful in these cases. 
And um, like Michelle said, being able to put it on a letterhead, the most important thing in these uh, conversations with the client about confidentiality and privilege is just letting them know what that means. So are you okay with them knowing the, that you received services from this program? Are you okay with them knowing that I'm your advocate? Um, and to make sure that they understand there can be potential consequences. Like, you know, are you okay with uh, understanding that they may reach back out to me and have questions? And then if they do, I'm happy to discuss with you like what you're comfortable with me sharing and what, what you, maybe you don't want me to share. But um, thank you, Michelle, also for sort of highlighting that. Um, so since we are talking about, uh, I brought up immigration, also moving on to immigration related to um, uh, uh, thinking about civil legal needs. So with immigration, um, the most, I think many of you are familiar with the U visa and the T visa um, options for victims of crime. So unfortunately, this is an area, <laughs> if you are working with the immigrant survivor, um, law enforcement, I know we're focusing on civil options as an alternative to criminal systems, but a U visa and T visa unfortunately does require law enforcement involvement because law enforcement is the certifier that then allows the survivor to be able to then apply for the U visa or T visa for immigration. Um, but there are so many other things that it's helpful to consider related to immigration um, when um, considering civil options and civil rights uh, when working with the survivor. So <clears throat> because I, I put the immigration attorney and BI representative at the very, very top because immigration is so complicated, um, because it can end up having a lot of uh, consequences and impact um, on a survivor's ability to stay in the country. Um, I would really, really encourage you to be able to connect a survivor to an immigration attorney um, or a BIA bo uh, board, of uh, board of Immigration Affairs, Board of Immigration Appeals representative um, because they are able to advise the survivor about their legal options and legal rights specifically related to immigration. If you are not aware of any BIA representatives or immigration attorneys um, in your program who you can identify as a resource, um, feel free to contact us or um, I would really encourage you to maybe start building those relationships. Uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, where I used to work at, is a great resource. But for example, with their VAWA waitlist, I think it's it, it's still pretty long. It's like a year or two years before you can get representation with an attorney. But sometimes um, if it's a quick question, um, your local immigration attorneys may be willing to consider um, volunteering on brief sort of advice type cases. Um, immigration is also an area that can feel very uncomfortable to talk about. Um, I've seen uh, advocates and attorneys who don't feel comfortable asking about immigration status. Um, one thing it's important to do is pay attention to what your requirements are with your reporting. Do you have to report how many undocumented people you're working with or immigrants are you working with? And then what kind of information related to that? Most of our reports, because we're many of us are VAWA funded, um, there are a lot of protections that should be in place. Um, so in most cases you should be fine, but the main thing is in your information collection, you just wanna follow through and make sure that you aren't required to share any identifying information. The reason why I say this is the last four years is the perfect example of how drastically the immigration system can change depending on the administration. 
if this was two years ago, I think this slide would look very, very different. But uh, the new <clears throat> Biden administration is already undoing a lot of the barriers the previous administration had put in place for immigrants, including immigrant survivors. So I'm a lot more hopeful about where we're at. But I do want to highlight immigration um, because it really is important to talk to the survivor about um, do they have immigration status, letting them know be, as an advocate, you have confidentiality with them and um, you are not going to be sharing that information with anybody without their, um, without their permission, except for whatever is required of your, I guess, reporting your grant requirements. Um, because depending on if the survivor is undocumented, depending on if the survivor is an immigrant themselves who does not have a green card, um, but is reliant on their abuser for immigration status, meaning maybe they came in on a fiance visa or they're here on a conditional green card, uh, which is connected to being married. Um, depending on the age that they came into the country, how old they were, how long they've been in the country, if they may qualify for DACA. Um, these are all things that you'll be able to assess if you're keeping immigration in mind. Um, it doesn't mean that you need to know the answer, but at least having, the, having some of this information helps you then be able to identify if you need to get the survivor connected to immigration resources. Um, things that you can do, let's say you are working with a survivor who identifies that they are not a US citizen, they're not maybe even really sure what their immigration status is because of maybe information that their parents shared with them or based on um, their abuser handling all the immigration documents. Um, even if you're not sure exactly or the survivor is not sure exactly what their immigration status is, things that you can do is help gather information to put together um, that can help with then determining if they do qualify for some sort of immigration application, um, that they already have what they need to get started for that application. So information about that they know about when they first came into this country, information about um, <clears throat> if they have any criminal history, either in the US or outside of the US, um, because if they're going to end up applying for immigration paperwork um, or immigration relief, that is information that they can't hide. And it's better to know what that information is ahead of time and proactively be able to explain it instead of trying to hide it. And then immigration does its own background check and it looks like the survivor was lying or trying to hide information from the government. Um, places of employment, past addresses, almost every immigration application ends up asking about all the addresses that you've lived in the last five years and the last address that you lived in outside of the US. So things like that actually can take a little bit of time to gather. Um, if the survivor has been working, at least helping them identify letters of support um, from their coworkers, if they're getting counseling and other support services, at least helping them identify who else they can be getting support letters from. If they go to church, those community support people. Um, we have a checklist that I'll also make sure to um, send Michelle um, that you can share with a survivor. I trying to remember if we translated it into Spanish yet or not. I think we did, I'll look for it. Um, that can essentially work as um, a checklist to help uh, immigrant survivors start gathering evidence. Another reason why it's important to be paying attention to immigration is depending on how other cases, other civil cases are handled, it can have an impact on a future immigration case for the survivor. So for example, I'll use an example 
of a protection order case that uh, we assisted a survivor on where um, the survivor had initially drafted the protection order uh, talking about how the abuser, um, even before they got married, had been engaging in stalking behavior and abusive behavior. But at the time, the survivor didn't identify. So the thing was, the survivor didn't ident identify that as abusive or stalking at the time, um, and then got married to their abuser and it of course escalated, the abuse escalated. So for the purpose of the protection order, the entire focus had been on all the stalking and abusive behavior before the marriage and during the marriage and the reason why the survivor needed the protection order. This, the advocate who was working with the survivor was paying attention and asked about immigration and then con contacted us and I'm really glad she did because that protection order declaration the survivor was going to submit would have become very problematic in the immigration case because in her immigration case, which in that moment she hadn't been thinking about, if she had ended up submitting um, paperwork to immigration with that protection order declaration, her application would have immediately been rejected because a core part of a certain type of VAWA, so VAWA petitions, a core part of a VAWA petition is you have to show immigration that when you entered into the marriage with your abuser, it was a good faith marriage, that at the time you believed that this would be a good marriage. Um, and the petition, the domestic violence petition, the way it was written, it originally did not read like that. Being able to work with the survivor the, to then talk about the fact that, you know, she didn't think about stalking or abusive behavior initially as problematic. In fact, she thought that was flattering that he was giving her so much attention and based in her culture, it was just considered, you know, really flattering that somebody well off is willing to give you that much consideration. So being able to pay attention to that and then rework the language in her domestic violence protection order really ensures that her immigration case is also protected and one case doesn't end up hurting another case. That was a really complicated example, but I just wanted to highlight why it's really important to also be thinking about uh, immigration as another civil option and those interconnected consequences if we're not uh, thinking holistically. So another area is, and I just want to say immigration is similar to family law. It's another complicated area. I'm happy to talk to folks um, about individual questions that they may have related to cases. Um, and then the NERP team is amazing. Um, Colectiva Legal, which is uh, also based in King County, uh, they're also another amazing resource, and I'm happy to help you connect to other immigration resources if you have questions um, about your cases. Employment is another area that I want to make sure that we're paying attention to. Um, it's obvious if the sexual assault or the stalking or the abuse occurred within the employment context. If you were sexually harassed by the, a coworker or a supervisor, or um, you know, it was at a work conference, sometimes the employment aspect is really, really obvious. At other times it's not. We may be so focused on the sexual assault that occurred um, in the domestic violence, in the domestic situation, or we're so focused on the sexual assault that occurred by, I don't know, by like um, an acquaintance, not in the employment context, we forget that there are these employment consequences that a survivor can also experience because of the sexual assault. Um, and even if the sexual assault or the DV is not connected to the workplace, the workplace can still end up becoming a hostile work environment if a survivor ends up sharing 
um, that they have experienced or that they're going through DV, sexual assault or stalking um, outside of the workplace. So um, this is where it's really helpful to be paying attention to employment legal issues. In Washington, obviously there is a leave allowed based on DV, sexual assault, stalking um, in the city of Seattle. For example, they have, uh, I think it's called it's safe. Um, I forget, safe and sick family time, uh, sick and sick leave, for example, you cannot get fired if you are needing to take time off related to a DV sexual assault um, stalking case. Um, you can't, you should not be punished. You should not be fired in the employment context if you're needing to go to court. So there are definitely protections in place related to ensuring that survivors are able to engage in other systems related to domestic violence. And I shouldn't just say court. It's also if you need time off to go to counseling, things like that are definitely protected here in Washington. Um, the survivor you may be working with may also actually need accommodations at the workplace, reasonable accommodations at the workplace related to domestic violence or sexual assault that they've experienced outside of the workplace. So for example, um, I had a client who had been sexually assaulted late at night while she ha was at a bus stop. And her work, um, a couple months later, they put on her on these late night shifts. And it was really triggering for her um, having to work late at night and go to work. Um, and she still had to commute by, by the, uh, through the bus. So making sure that her workplace made the appropriate accommodations to her schedule so that she was not having to travel at night. Um, these are some of the things to be thinking about related to the employment process. Here, if there is abuse happening within the employment context, um, either because a survivor has identified as a survivor because of something, uh, because of an assault that happened outside of the employment context or because of within the employment context, context it's also really important to be paying attention to timelines. Um, so for example, um, uh, depending on if you uh, file a complaint at the state level, against your employer, if you file a complaint at the um, federal level against your employer, it really, there are timelines that you have to follow to ensure that that complaint is handled and processed. Um, <clears throat> so that's also something to be paying attention to when working with a survivor. Um, just really quickly, because we're talking about the Leave Act, for example, um, it applies to all employers, the one at the very top. It applies to all employers, public or private. This is a question that we often get from survivors. So be, just because it's a small uh, uh, you know, family owned business, it doesn't mean that they get, there's any exception to what kind of employer they are. Um, also the Leave Act though, it has to be reasonable. Um, so that is something for the survivor to consider what is reasonable. Um, with the Family Leave Act, for example, that unfortunately is a little more limiting. Um, so it depends on the size of the employer. And it does, I think, allow up to 12, 12 weeks of unpaid, um, unpaid time off per year. Uh, with the ADA, um, it can be physical or mental impairment um, that really, uh, the language is that um, it's an impairment that limits uh, major life activity. So we actually really point to the ADA in the employment context based on the PTSD and the trauma that a survivor is um, experiencing. So using my client and her fear of waiting late at night at the bus stop. I mean, that was under the ADA that we got, um, got those accommodations made with the employer. Protection orders, again, maybe the survivor, um, maybe the employer isn't making the appropriate accommodations. Maybe they aren't mo moving the abuser 
the rapist away or putting them on a different schedule and they're still expecting the survivor to work with uh, their abuser, a protection order uh, can be a way to at least temporarily address that and hopefully permanently um, if the court grants the protection order. Um, the discrimination based on sex, sexual harassment, these are things that have been discussed before. Related to them, it's also really important to be paying attention to retaliation. If a survivor has been terminated, if they've been fired, if they've been put on leave, when did that happen? Under what context did that happen? For example, in COVID-19, during COVID, one thing that we've seen is um, survivors who may have reported a sexual assault before or sexual harassment before COVID we're suddenly now being terminated using COVID as an excuse. Um, but it was very clear that it was actually in retaliation because of reporting sexual harassment uh, and discrimination. So those are also just things to be exploring with the clients that you're working with. I mean, main thing is to document as much as you can and get as much information as you can address like their safety security issues related to employment. Um, and uh, in some cases, as an advocate, things that you can do is help help them maybe communicate with their HR or um, attend the meeting with HR and their supervisor. Um, we've seen advocates not be allowed to attend, but being able to create a record where you're emailing them and just saying, you know, the survivor has reached out to us for services, has asked me to accompany them to this meeting, to this conversation. Um, and if they respond saying that that's not allowed, that's actually information that's helpful if the survivor then decides that they do wanna pursue some sort of uh, complaint or some sort of uh, litigation against the employer. Um, Another just consideration around employment, depending on employment, the survivor may qualify for unemployment and then also may qualify for crime victim compensation if there have been maybe lost wages related to the sexual assault. Uh, how am I doing on time? Let me see. Okay, so we're at about an hour. I'm gonna try to wrap it up in the next 15 minutes so that we have time to also um, to go through any other questions. Um, this may not obviously seem like a legal, civil legal issue, but we actually do end up working on a lot of financial and benefits related issues related to survivors. Um, I'm not gonna get into it because many of you are probably familiar with crime victim compensation. And I know Wixup has great resources related to um, crime victim, uh, crime victim comp. But also thinking about, does the survivor qualify for any um, benefits, any public benefits related to um, the sexual assault? Maybe because of the assault, um, they now have a temporary disability. Maybe they're needing cash assistance. Maybe they do qualify for unemployment. So those are some financial, uh, some public benefits to consider exploring with the survivor other financial considerations is restitution. If there is a criminal case, um, a survivor at the very end should be able to request restitution. So these are costs specific to the, the sexual assault. So if maybe um, uh, the property had been damaged because of the sexual assault and the survivor had to pay out of pocket for that, um, any costs like counseling related costs that maybe aren't covered through insurance or crime victim comp, these are things that a survivor can be requesting through the restitution process through the criminal case. But um, we've seen prosecutors offices that don't follow up with survivors um, and they miss out on that opportunity. So it's something to identify with your client if it's something that they would be interested in um, and then helping them document. Um, also related to financial is when and when, when can a survivor access paid leave versus unpaid leave? That's also something to kind of explore with them. 
we've actually seen a lot of survivors relate to finances, um, having problems with their credit because their abuser stole their identity, um, because their abuser essentially committed fraud, things like that. And then it ends up having an impact on the survivor. So that's just another aspect of the financial civil legal issues to be paying attention to. Sometimes if it's so messy, it may be worth exploring bankruptcy also with the survivor. Um, it's not ideal, but for some, in some ways, it's, it's a way of trying to get a lot of um, credit damage forgiven, especially if it's been caused by the abuser and then start afresh. And then privacy is an area that we identify as its own civil legal issue. Um, especially in the sexual assault context, uh, because privacy concerns cut across so many different areas. It ap applies to the work, um, it, it applies to work, it applies to school, it apl applies to social settings. Um, so really thinking about how privacy works and the legal needs related to privacy. It, what I mean by varying requirements at an agency or institution involved. So for example, privacy, when you're getting a SANE examination is very, very different to privacy when you're just going into the doctor for a regular exam. A SANE examination, for example, the sexual assault nurse examination, um, that is also a collection of forensic evidence. So that information is something that law enforcement could end up getting access to. Um, but a separate medical appointment with your primary care provider where you're talking about a sexual assault, that does not have that same um, access. So uh, thinking about privacy is really important. Another example of why it depends on the institution or agency is for example, under Title IX, um, under, under Title IX, a lot of college campuses essentially are mandatory reporting campuses. So they require that any of their staff, when a sexual assault is reported to them, they are mandated to report. Um, other college campuses, um, not necessarily everybody is mandated to report. There are some protected um, positions where a uh, uh, college survivor may be able to report and not have it become an official Title IX report. K through 12, however, um, middle school, high school, if a sexual assault is, um, is reported, the school has obligations. Um, so this is what I mean by privacy considerations. You know, we talked about privilege and certifications related to immigration, um, not uh, immigration, but letters of support related to immigration or certifications related to housing. So really thinking about the uh, privacy concerns of the client and asking the survivor, what are they okay and not okay sharing? Um, and what is required for you to provide that certifications? For example, the landlord breaking the lease, the letter requires some very specific details. So those are some privacy considerations. Um, Maintaining privacy in criminal family law cases, protection order cases, we so often see a detective or a prosecutor just hand a, basically a waiver, a, a confidentiality release agreement to survivors. And they're like, oh, just, you know, just sign this and we'll just get your records from the hospital. We'll just go ahead and get your mental health records because we need it for the case. Just because they're asking doesn't mean the survivor has to agree to it. Um, one thing that we always want to do with survivors, if you're working with a survivor and you're just not sure if it's appropriate for them to sign it, um, to talk to your supervisor, talk to us about, you know, if it's appropriate for the survivor to sign over all their confidential information or if there are ways to limit it. So for example, when a prosecutor or detective is saying that, you know, go ahead and sign this hospital release so that we can talk to all these people. I'll often work with the client to like craft a language that says, um, you know, I'm, I'm providing permission related to the sexual assault 
uh, examination and kit um, and that, you know, conducted on this day, but nothing else. Um, so there are ways to also limit it. And that's something that it's really important to be discussing with survivors around their legal options when it comes to their privacy. Also, sometimes it's not necessarily a form, but it's actually a subpoena the survivor gets or as a part of the case, they're suddenly being required to disclose information they don't feel comfortable disclosing. Um, and in that case, uh, it's helpful to be able to ask the sur work with a survivor in maybe crafting a response or con connecting to a lawyer to make sure that if there needs to be a legal argument um, that the survivor is supported, please, please, please with your clients, let them know, especially if they get something from the court, not to ignore it because we've had cases where the survivor didn't take the subpoena seriously or they didn't pay attention to what they were getting paperwork wise and then the deadline to be able to respond or object uh, has been missed and the information once it's out there, it's really hard to get it back, um, get it protected. Many of you are qualified to work with survivors on getting them registered for the address confidentiality. So never forget that that's also a legal, um, essentially a quasi legal issue to be paying attention to um, and an option that a survivor may really wanna explore with you. At the very end, I highlighted media and defamation claims. This is something that we might not think about immediately related to, oops, let me go back, related to the survivors we work with, but there are definitely legal consequences related to survivors sharing their story. And it's important to be able to at least explore those. Our position is a survivor should be able to tell their story to whoever they wanna share it with whenever and whatever platform or medium they want to. It's their experience. Nobody else should control that narrative. However, abusers do end up using um, sort of public statements and a survivor going public against them. We often get survivors contacting us who have now ended up with a defamation lawsuit against them by their abuser. That doesn't mean it's a valid lawsuit. It doesn't mean that the survivor can't win, but it's intimidating and it becomes another way that the abuser is now using the court system to punish the survivor. Um, so it's just helpful to let them know that yes, you know, you should share your story, but just know that this is a potential consequence. If you need to talk to an attorney about what that can look like, you know, we're happy to connect you to one. With the media also, we want media to be paying attention to sexual assault. We want you know, the public to recognize that this is an epidemic in itself that deserves um, the proper attention that survivors deserve to be heard. Um, the examples of Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein and Epstein <clears throat> are all examples of how powerful sur survivor voices can be when they're especially lifted up by the media. But at the same time, once a survivor starts working with a journalist or shares their story with a journalist or with media, they don't necessarily have control of, over the narrative anymore. So we also like to work with survivors on figuring out how do they want to engage with the media? What are they comfortable sharing? Because once that's out, um, it, it can feel re-victimizing when you see your narrative, when you see your story being used in ways that you didn't intend for it to be used. Um, so those are also just privacy considerations within the legal context um, to consider. And we're almost at the end. Okay, so Title IX, you know, I kind of touched on this related to, related to <clears throat> reporting and privacy. Um, Title IX for any survivor who is a student or maybe recently was a student is something that you do wanna also consider. We have um, clients where we're helping them go through the student conduct process on campus while we're also helping them get a protection order while we're also making sure that the prosecutors are working on the criminal case. So 
a lot of times we're used to kind of focusing on the protection on the criminal side in the community, but we don't necessarily think about the campus stuff. We think about campus as its own closed environment. Sorry, I'm gonna <clears throat> get it. And because campuses have their own process, often I see community advocates not get involved and that's okay, but I would really, really recommend when you're working with a student survivor to talk to them, do they have a campus advocate that is help, able to navigate the campus system with them? And even if the campus advocate is able to navigate the campus student conduct process with them, um, depending on how that goes, if the survivor wants to pursue anything off campus. So let's say they have the campus hearing and then they don't they don't end up sanctioning, they don't end up dismissing the abusive student or the abusive staff member. Um, does this student now wanna file a Title IX complaint at the federal level? Um, the reason it's important to be exploring that with the survivor is because there are very clear deadlines when Title IX complaints have to be filed by. And once you miss that, you miss the opportunity to be able to hold that school accountable through the federal process. On campus also, <clears throat> often um, students are told, oh, you're allowed to have, you know, a staff person, somebody from campus, you know, be your support person. That is not the same thing as an advocate. Um, and so also making sure that if, the survivor wants you there and you have the capacity to be there that you can accompany them and support them um, through the Title IX process. Uh, there are a lot of ways to approach uh, campus Title IX issues. There's obviously related to sexual assault, which is what we um, are most familiar with, with Title IX, but there's also appropriate accommodations. Legally, campuses are required to have an investigation process. So the question is, are they appropriately investigating and they're supposed to make appropriate accommodations for the survivor. So, you know, once a complaint has been made, once campus officials, this is K through 12 and college, once they've been made aware of the sexual assault, um, what accommodations have they made with the survivor to ensure that sh maybe she or he or they are not in the same classroom as their rapist or that they ha aren't required to like have lunch in the same space. I often um, for my school cases, school related cases, I'll actually <laughs> drive to the school and figure out its layout so that when the other side, when the defense or when the respondent or when the school is saying, oh, we've done everything, um, or, you know, the survivor's asking for too much with wanting to like, you know, be in a different classroom or not be in the same common space because our school is so big. I can come back and then say, actually, most of your school, like it's all glass or there's just like one hallway. So no matter what, like, unless you create an appropriate schedule, the survivor's required to spend time in that hallway with, the, with their rapist. So thinking about those accommodations and asking your client, what kind of accommodations has the school really made? And depending on what their experience has been with the school, exploring, are they interested in filing a complaint? Are they interested um, in pushing an investigation? Are they interested in maybe transferring the school? Um, so those are some sort of, some of the legal sort of options to explore related to Title IX and education. I also put down FERPA because of two reasons. One is often when a survivor is trying to access information from the school, a lot of times they'll use FERPA as a reason not to provide information to the student um, because they'll say, oh, well, we can't, if it's connected to any other student, we can't share information with you. And so sometimes schools use that as a gatekeeping method. But in other ways, if uh, the survivor's records are being subpoenaed maybe by the respondent by defense, FERPA is also a way of making sure that the survivor is protected. 
So if they do find out about a subpoena, I want to make sure that all of you are aware that the survivor has rights under FERPA, under Title IX to try to keep that information protected. And I think the last one in the legal issue, oh no, there are two more small claims. This is just very quick. This is an area that is a legal option, civil legal option for a survivor, but actually doesn't require attorneys at all. It's only monetary. Um, small claims courts, you cannot actually be represented. You cannot come in with an attorney. This is where an advocate can be really, really helpful. Often it's at the district court level um, and it can be for claims up to $10,000. Small claims is not where you ask for like, you know, damages or money based on emotional distress or anything like that. This is where there are actual receipts or actual costs related that are connected to the respondent that you are asking to be compensated for. So if maybe property was damaged or um, uh, you had to break the lease and then you've ended up with all these financial penalties, but it's the respondent's fault. These are examples of what, um, what a survivor can claim in small claims. The nice thing about small claims is depending on the type of claim it is, there's actually a very broad statute of limitations. So even though we don't represent survivors in small claims, if there is a small claims possibility uh, for a survivor that you have questions about, feel free to reach out, but it's meant to be super, super user-friendly and I'm happy to send you additional resources. And the last area is civil lit litigation. We actually don't do personal injury ourselves. There are a lot of private attorneys who do personal injury claims and by civil litigation, personal injury tort claims, I'm talking about this is where you're asking about, you know, emotional distress and like injuries, asking to be compensated for injuries. Um, when working with a personal injury attorney, we really, really recommend working with somebody who's worked with survivors before because connecting back to the privacy area, civil litigation is one of those areas where once you go down this path, uh, often the survivor's life is opened up completely like a book um, because both sides get to subpoena for information, both sides get to ask about questions um, that often a lot of other um, processes are, there's some protections in place to prevent, for example, like rape shield and protection orders, a survivor sexual history shouldn't be brought up. But in civil litigation case, that may actually come up. Um, so it's just something to explore related to how much is the survivor concerned about their privacy being violated. Um, also related to a personal injury attorney, making sure it's somebody who has worked with survivors before because of the unique dy dynamics of sexual assault. It's really important to work with a personal injury attorney who understands trauma, who understands <clears throat> how to talk about sexual assault in a respectful way that maintains the survivor's dignity. And we have recommendations for personal injury attorneys Another really important thing to consider about related to civil litigation is, does the respondent have the ability to, do they even have money? I may want to sue my rapist, but if, if they just don't have any assets or any cash or any way to be able to pay, is it worth that painful process? Is it worth going through that painful process? So it's something to discuss with the survivor I also do want to say just because the um, rapist or the assailant themselves may not have the ability to pay doesn't mean that a survivor can't explore a personal injury case because depending on where, um, where it happened or under whose sort of supervision it happened, there may be other ways. So I may not be able to I may know that my coworker suing them is not going to really matter because they have nothing, but uh, my employer really protected them um, and put me in a place that made me vulnerable to that sexual assault. So maybe I can sue that third party employer or maybe um, the, 
the conference I was at where I was sexually assaulted um, through the insurance company, I may be able to um, actually collect on damages. So there are, there are aspects of civil litigation that are worth exploring, um, but it's, it's helpful to be able to talk through that. And because of the statute of limitations, you always just wanna make sure that the survivor is kind of thinking if they are interested in exploring that option that they have a chance to be able to discuss it and think about it um, instead of maybe three or four years later, you know, being very upset that, you know, nobody ever told them about this option. So those are all the kind of legal areas. Um, there's sort of a last couple of slides, but I wanted to actually take another pause to make sure um, there's an opportunity to ask questions. Oh, and I see um, Michelle put in the chat the Crime Victim Comp um, presentation, Prezi. That's great. Oh, I love all the, <laughs> all the resources. Thank you, Michelle, for putting all of that into the chat. OK. If there aren't any immediate questions, and just a reminder, again, you can always email me with questions afterwards or you can send them to Michelle. And if there are similar questions, maybe we could do a follow-up sort of FAQ that we can send back to folks. Um, but some final considerations, uh, cause we're at noon and I wanted to, I thought we had two hours, but <laughs> maybe we don't. Um, but I do still wanna make sure folks have time. Um, so final considerations is, you know, we're talking about these civil legal areas, but the fact is that I just do want to recognize that we're in the middle of a pandemic and um, even without the pandemic, it's, it's easier said than done. Um, but while there are civil legal options for survivors to be considering with you, um, I also recognize that there's less access to immediate support and community and survivors are feeling more isolated and disconnected. More survivors don't wanna be, a, our clients that we work with, they don't wanna be a burden on like systems. They know a lot of folks are going through a lot, um, but the fact is that trauma is being exacerbated right now, even more so than ever before. Um, the other thing, <laughs> all of you just spent like over 90 minutes with me on Zoom. Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Um, and for many of us, secondary trauma is also um, something that's being triggered by a lot of the increase that we're seeing in sexual assault and DV and just the way that we're having to approach the work and services are moving online, like telehealth and things like that. Um, so I, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that there are these mental health factors, um, even with when we're talking about civil litigation and civil options, it's still triggering and it's still exhausting for survivors to think about like, you know, I don't wanna go through that checklist of housing, immigration, employment, family, education. I don't wanna have to think about this stuff. I just want it to stop. I just wanna feel better. I just want this one issue I'm coming to you with to be resolved. And I recognize that and we recognize that. So, um, and uh, hoping that you also don't feel frustrated if you, with this information, you feel, you know, excited to be able to explore all these options with the clients that you're working with. Um, and just right now might not be the time, unfortunately. But the idea is that you have this in your toolbox um, going forward. Similarly, systems factors. We could have all the right laws in place. We could have all the options explored, but unfortunately we are still working within a very shitty system that really upholds rape culture and still protects assailants. Um, and that's just another reality. Um, the idea with exploring all these civil legal options 
is not that we are guaranteeing justice for the survivors. We're just giving them more pathways to hopefully justice and hopefully accountability and some sort of resolution um, and just giving them more options to explore so they don't feel like, you know, they're just sort of stuck on one process that maybe they didn't want to be involved in like the criminal system or like you know, maybe they don't want to deal with the protection order right now, but they want their employment situation to be better. Um, so just recognizing also that the systems also <laughs> end up becoming a huge barrier in this process. And we recognize that. Um, I mean, even right now with COVID-19, courts and judges are being so inconsistent. Like we have some judges who are wanting to have hearings via Zoom having other judges who want us to call in. We have other judges who want to call us. I've had some judges who want us to just come into court. Um, and the burden just continues to be on the survivors um, instead of the system accommodating them. The system right now is using, I think, the, um, the pandemic as an excuse to create more burdens. That being said, for example, WICSAP, our program, we've been working on legislation to try to improve the, for example, the protection order process. And I don't know, Michelle, if you can share like information or maybe um, information has gone out through the membership around the house bill that's gonna be up um, soon. But there are attempts being made to improve the systems, but we also recognize the system barriers. And then last, Lastly, now more than ever are the tech issues. Um, we're asking survivors to engage <laughs> in tech systems that often, like I talked about before at the very beginning, our tech initiative, these platforms can also end up becoming sources of abuse. And that is also really difficult um, for many of our survivors that we're working with. Um, even if the tech itself isn't a source of further stalking and abuse, not all of our clients have access to technology or easy access to technology or understand necessarily the, the, how to engage in the platforms that we're expecting them to engage with. Um, if anything, <laughs> a lot of my adult clients, their kids, are, their kids have a better understanding than they do and have been like, uh, unfortunately helping them navigate, <laughs> um, even though, um, uh, a child should not be in that position, but it's just the reality of the um, work that we're doing. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge these additional factors, um, even though we just covered a lot of legal areas that you know all of this connects with each other, similar to within the civil legal system, just like protection order might be connected to a housing issue, which might be connected to a family law issue, which might then be connected to a privacy issue. There are these mental health considerations, these tech considerations, these systems considerations as well um, that are also connected to the legal issues. Because we're talking about tech and remote hearings are becoming more and more a part of the legal system right now. I just have this slide about sort of thinking about best practices related to um, survivors having to go through the court system um, and thinking about the place where they're at, um, practicing with the survivor and preparing for the hearing, and then how to like present the case through tech. Um, so uh, we actually have a handout on this too that I'll make sure to share with Michelle, but I wanted to put it up on this slide as well. Uh, and this is its own <laughs> training too. So uh, this is just a very quick summary. And then the last thing is I just shared a lot of information. Like I just did a huge brain dump on all of you. And so I understand <laughs> that it's, um, it's a lot to try to like, re to think about and uh, start thinking about applying it to your advocacy. So just remembering, just like you, all of us, like in the end, what we're trying to do is advocate with humility. Um, and there are gonna be issues that we miss. Um, there's often, we have weekly staffing on cases. And um, you know, just the other day, last week, I was talking about a case that I was working on and my coworkers made me realize that I had not actually explored this one legal issue with the client. 
that f- was also very much connected. And I've been in this position for almost nine years now. Um, and so it's inevitable that you're going to miss something. It's okay. Be, be, um, be graceful with yourself. Um, the most, most important thing is that you're expanding your resources and your tools to be able to advocate for the survivors you work with um, and um, to recognize that mistakes are gonna happen, but uh, there are always gonna be more opportunities to learn and grow. If you need assistance from us, this is uh, information about our program. Um, You can find our website find us on our website. Um, The legal line is the line that I was telling you about that you can contact our attorneys to talk through any legal cases, or you can email us um, at legal line at SV Law Center with any questions that you have, or if you want to send a referral about a case where you feel like the survivor could really uh, um, benefit from representation. And then there's my email also at the bottom. I would really encourage you to email legal line and copy me instead of just emailing me directly just because sometimes I'm just super, super behind (laughs) on email, but um, our attorneys, we rotate through and somebody is checking the legal line email every day. Um, So usually you'll get a response within a day, if not two. And the last thing is thank you so much for all the work you do. Um, Thank you for um being there for survivors and i hope that we all look out for each other and support each other and um that's it any questions thank you reedy i love this um little gif at the end that's lovely um i'm going to send out emails afterwards to those folks who were attending today as well as those folks who registered who weren't able to be here today um once the recording is up And with all these resources that we've talked about, the resources that we're working on in collaboration and regarding the legislation, Susan is getting ready to send something out um, in the coming days about that legislation that we were working on related to the consistency um, of like COVID kind of court stuff. Um, We want to thank Reedy and the Sexual Violence Law Center for um, their great partnership with us and um, being here today to present. I know two hours is so long to talk, Um, so I hope that you're able to get a break, Reedy, and thanks so much, everyone, for being here. An evaluation link will also uh, be coming with, and we look forward to hearing your feedback.